the meeting to order, please. Can I ask you all to take your seats? And Doug, will you please call the roll? Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Alvarado. Commissioner Burke. Commissioner Dunn. Commissioner Gilmetti. Commissioner Guardino. Commissioner Kehoe. Commissioner Tavaloni. Commissioner Van Kenneinerberg. Chair Inman. Here. Senator Bell, Assemblymember Frazier. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you very much, Doug. Okay, I'm gonna skip item two because I don't believe the mayor has gotten back from Sacramento yet. So we'll hold a little bit and Therese McMullen, wherever you are, if you'll give me a little wave when he gets here, we'll go back to item number two. So with that, we will now move to item number three, resolution of necessity. Terry. Good afternoon, commissioners. This appearance relates to impacts caused by a $14.8 million shop safety project in Nevada County on State Route 174. The commission scheduled this condemnation appearance at the request of property owners, Rachel Corona and Mark E. Carroll. The impacted property is 12.98 acres in size. The department needs 0.17 acres in fee, 0.13 acres in a utility easement, and 0.1 acres in a temporary construction easement. Under eminent domain law, a property owner whose property is under condemnation consideration has the right to appear before the commission to question three and only three issues. Number one, does public interest and necessity require the proposed project. Number two, is the project planned and located in a manner that will be most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury? Number three, is the property necessary for the proposed project? The commission neither determines the amount of compensation for the property rights to be acquired, nor deals with any issue other than the three just stated. Government Code 7267.2 requires the department to make an offer to purchase the property rights needed. The department has made the required offer. Code of Civil Procedures section 1245.240 specifies eight affirmative votes for commission approval of a resolution of necessity. Mike Whiteside, the department's assistant chief engineer, is ready to make the department's presentation to be followed by the property owners. Yeah, okay, good. It's a little tall here. Um, the department requests your approval of this resolution of necessity so we can commence with safety improvements to State Route 174 in District 3, Nevada County. The property is owned by Rachel Corona and Mark Carroll. Oh, and for the record, I'm Mike Whiteside, the Assistant Chief Engineer. For this project, uh, we require 54 parcels. 45 parcels have been acquired Eight have uncontested RONs already adopted, and this is the last parcel required to move the project. So here you see the project location about 50 miles northeast of Sacramento in rural Nevada County. Uh, 174 connects Grass Valley to Colfax and is commonly called the Colfax Highway. So zooming into the blue line there is the project limits. It's about 1.9 miles long. Uh, the project has a mitigated negative declaration for CEQA and a categorical exclusion for NEPA. These were prepared in September of 2016. The subject parcel is now shown there at the north end in green. So this is a safety project. The statistics you see here are from the approved project report from September of 2016. Within the project limits, the uh, Roadway is experiencing a pattern of run-off-the-road collisions where cars are losing control, leaving the roadway, and striking fixed objects like trees, embankments, or other objects. Uh, as you can see, the uh, collision rate is well above the statewide average. Uh, that was, these statistics are based on data between 2010 and 2013. Of course, the project report came out in 2016. There's a lag. But we have reviewed data as late as December of 2018 and that data reinforces the need for this project. So I'm going to take you on a quick video tour of just the north end of this project. Gina, could you start the video? So it's a lovely highway. 
it is not a scenic highway. It has not been designated as such. Uh, it is a conventional two-lane highway. Uh, it's lots of curved through rolling terrain. The lanes are about 11 feet wide or so. Shoulders vary from about two inches up to approximately five feet in some areas. I know this video isn't very good, but as we pass the bicycler on the right and the truck on the left, going around the curve, you'll notice that the right shoulder does go down pretty much to that, that two inch uh, limit. There is no recoverable zone for, uh, for errant vehicles. There's embankments, trees, as well as man-made objects. Uh, like on the left side of the roadway here, you'll see some, I believe those are mailboxes and there are telephone poles there on the right or power poles on the right. And the subject parcel will be on the left. Just beyond this next curve, you'll see a uh, timber fence right about here. And that is the subject parcel on the left. There we go. So the project purpose is to improve safety and operations for all users, including bicyclists and pedestrians. The project seeks to reduce the number of collisions by improving the alignment, widening the lanes to a standard 12 feet, and providing consistent 12 foot shoulders along the length of the project, or excuse me, eight foot shoulders along the length of the project. The goal is to provide in improved visibility so drivers can see further ahead, uh, provide recoverable space for errant vehicles, and increase safety, not only for the, uh, the motoring public, but for stop vehicles who are perhaps broken down on the side of the road or for CHP or fire trucks, for service vehicles like school buses that travel less this route, mail delivery and garbage pickup, as well as non-motorized travelers such as people riding bicycles and people walking. So here we see the subject parcel is about 13 acres zoned agricultural, mostly covered in forest. It does include a residence, now highlighted in yellow, that sits at nearest point, 580 feet back from the existing roadway. There are several buildings, uh, uh, fences, landscaping, and irrigation as well. What I'm not showing in the slide is that paralleling State Route 174, on the right side of the existing roadway there, the roadway's in gray, there, is, uh, there are power lines and telephone lines. We have to move those as part of this project, and I'll show you a little bit more of that later. Now blue is the proposed project. What we're doing is moving the roadway about 25 feet closer to the residence, and that's at the closest point. So zooming into the impacts uh, on the property itself, the existing roadway there is shown in gray. The proposed uh, roadway, that's the proposed asphalt, is now in blue, uh, and you see the proposed right-of-way line. This requires 0.17 acres in fee acquisition. We need a tenth of an acre for a temporary construction easement so that the project can be constructed, and 0.13 acres uh, to move those utilities. So at the ground level, let's see what it looks like. You see the existing roadway, the yellow line is the existing right-of-way line, and blue is the proposed right-of-way line. Now we're acquiring a wedge-shaped piece, and we're taking out a curve, so the, the acquisition is a little bit irregularly shaped, uh, So and it varies from 13 feet to 35 feet, but we're using, on average, it's about 25 feet, and that's at the point closest to the residence. So, in addition to public meetings and open houses held during the environmental process, uh, the project team has worked extensively with citizens groups, uh, namely the uh, Save 174 group, during the design phase, and the design team made significant modifications to the entire project to minimize the impacts, to minimize the amount of property acquired and the number of trees to be taken out. We adjusted the alignment and elevations. We steepened the embankments on the sides of the slope. We steep steepened them to pull them in a little bit tighter. We narrowed what's called the shoulder backing. That's the level area beyond the paved shoulder. Usually that's four foot. We narrowed that down to two foot. We eliminated a 10 foot maintenance strip that we like to have at the foot of our embankments for maintenance purposes. And we re removed the shoulder side rumble strip to uh, decrease noise. What that resulted in was the right of way required went from 14.7 acres down to less than four acres, and the number of trees removed went from 1,700 down to about 550. Those are approximate numbers. 
uh, all making this a much safer stretch of roadway and as quiet as possible. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Um, uh, up top there you see the initial design that was with all the standard features that we would normally put into a project. After working with the groups, uh, the SA-174 group, we now have our current design. And what I want you to take away from this is that we pulled back the right-of-way line by 20 feet. So currently, we're asking for about 25 feet on the frontage of their property. But the original design, it would have been 45 feet. So we've pulled it back by 20 feet. So in working with the property owners, they've uh, submitted many requests, including contour grading sheets, technical design memos, uh, design plans, environmental documents, hydraulic studies, and um, meeting uh, info. Uh, all of that has been sent. In addition, the owners requested a custom seed mix and that we locate and either protect in place or relocate a private drain line on their property during construction. We have provided for those two requests uh, by putting provisions into the construction contract. And finally, uh, they requested a specific fence type and height and that we uh, compensate for reconnecting their irrigation system. And those are compensation issues. So we have four contentions outstanding. First, the property owner contends that we should reduce the shoulder widths uh, the eight-foot shoulders aren't needed. We should reduce them to four feet. Department's response is eight-foot eight shoulders provide a traversable area for errant vehicles to regain control. The eight-foot provides an area for disabled vehicles or emergency vehicles like CHP or fire. It provides room for bicycles, pedestrians, mail delivery, school buses, trash pickup, and all to uh, conduct business and be out of the way of the main lanes. And it will also uh, speed up evacuations should there be a wildfire. I don't have a bullet up here on that, but we do have a letter from Nevada County Board of Supervisors to Governor Newsom dated February of this year in which they specifically ask for the state to uh, widen the state highways in this area because of the threat of wildfire. Uh, in addition, I'd like to say this design has been independently reviewed by the head of Caltrans Design who is also the state traffic safety, formerly the state traffic safety engineer, Janice Benton. She is here in the audience today, uh, if you'd like to ask any questions. And she has concurred that this design balances the safety requirement or the safety purpose of this project with minimizing impacts to the area. Oh, pardon me. So um, next, the property owner contends that tree removal will yeah, create a negative visual impact and increase glare. Um, the department's response is, there are no trees removed from the owner's parcel. There are trees removed two parcels down where headlights would have a direct line of sight towards the residents. Uh, but given the relative proximity, the distance, the elevation difference, and that there are trees around the home and between the home and the source of headlights, that uh, the department believes that tree removal will, not ca will cause a minimum visual impact and not increase glare. And a picture's worth a thousand words. So here you go. In the bottom center, you see a red circle. That would be where the direct line of sight of headlights would shine towards the, um, the residents. It is over a thousand feet or three and a half football fields dis difference in uh, distance. There's a 75 foot uh, elevation difference between the level of the headlights and the residence itself, and there are trees and buildings between. In addition, generally headlights point towards the roadway, not, not up. Next, the property owner contends that the project will impact drainage. It'll cause driveway flooding, and they ask that we, uh, as part of our project, increase the culvert under their driveway, the drainage culvert under their driveway. The department's response is, that we did a hydraulic analysis and the existing culvert is undersized. This currently causes flooding of the neighbor's upstream pasture as well as the driveway. Um, the hydraulic calculations also show that there would be negligible increase in flow caused by this project uh, on the order of 0.2% increase in a 100-year rain event. 
In addition, the culvert is outside the project limits, so we cannot replace it as part of our construction contract, and this becomes a compensation issue. Finally, the property owner contends that the roadway is being moved closer to the residents, uh, and that will increase noise. The department's response is, it's true it is 25 foot closer, uh, but this, it is 25 foot closer. I'd like to note that, again, this is a safety project, and following California and federal guidelines, a, a noise study wasn't required as part of the 2016 environmental review. So no noise study was done. However, the department did consult uh, about potential impacts with our noise specialists, who indicated that any increase in noise would not be perceptible to a normal, healthy human ear. And that's because of the distance, over 500 feet. Uh, and we are not increasing the volume of traffic or the speed of traffic. We are maintaining the existing speed limit that's out there, I think is uh, 45 miles an hour. So in summary, the public interest and necessity require the proposed project. The project is planned and located in a manner most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury. The property sought to be condemned is necessary for the project and an offer of just compensation has been made. In closing, uh, the department requests, uh, the department will continue to actively negotiate with the property owners. We did offer to meet this morning uh, to try and settle this. Uh, our offer was refused. However, to keep this safety project on schedule, we ask that you pass this resolution of necessity today. Unfortunately, um, Amarjeet Benapal was not able to join us today, the District 3 director, but I have uh, Carl Dreher, with, who is uh, with District 3 Design, and we'll be happy to answer any questions today. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Gometti. How many parcels did you have to acquire? Uh, we need 54 for the entire project. And how many have you acquired so far? 45 are signed. Okay. And then we have eight that were uncontested runs that have already been passed, that you've already passed. So how many are left? One. This is the last parcel to move the project. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Burke. I have just one question. In the event that there is flooding, uh, is there anything that can be done to assure that that will be corrected? Well, or is there uh, any kind of representation? You know, the, there, there's always something that can be done. The question is that the, the driveway right now causes the flooding upstream and, and it does overtop, but, and that in a way limits the flow one consideration is you have to look at the whole system. If we suddenly open that up, we could be flooding downstream at the next, at the next property. So um, we have not studied that, but we can't do it as part of our project because it is outside our project limits. It wasn't covered by our environmental document. And so we have offered compensation or, or included it as part of a compensation package. Uh, I my question really is that in the event it's someone was wrong in the evaluation and flooding does occur, as a matter of course, would you then uh, remedy that, any flooding that occurred to other properties? Um, I'm not quite sure I get it, but the uh, flooding is not caused by the state highway system. I think if something is does occur, we would certainly be open to discussing it and seeing what we can do cooperatively. Absolutely. And you would have that discussion. Any other questions? Um, thank you, Mike, for the visuals. I really appreciate the large font and the nice uh, Google Earth images. It really helps us all to uh, have those. So um, I have just one question for you. The state of California has a law asking every driver to stay at least three feet away from a bicyclist. So is there, within this proposed design, we can accommodate that law without asking our vehicles to Yes, and we have the eight foot shoulders. If we go down to four foot, we obviously could, couldn't assure that drivers are more, more than that. I mean, a bicycle would have to be on the very edge of the pavement to be achieve that three foot without drivers having to swerve around them. So is that a problem then in going from eight to four? Yes, it, it is going, eight, it is a problem. And, and I'm afraid I didn't include one message I meant to state in here, but actually 
when we're trying to achieve this level of safety, we have the eight foot shoulders and we've worked with other features to pull in the right of way required. If we go to four foot shoulders, we would have to look at making our embankments much gentler. Mm -hmm. We would have to have our shoulder backing would double from, I think it's two foot to four foot. That's the area beyond the paved shoulder. Um, so in the end, a uh, four foot shoulder would actually push the right of way line out about five feet uh, in front of the parcel. I know that's not intuitive. You think going from eight foot to four that we just pull four back. No, when you combine it with all the other safety features that we have to put in place to achieve the purpose of the project, it would actually push the uh, right of way line out another five feet. So I guess my question then is this, this is safe. We're not creating another issue. We, it is safe, yes. You look like you're being joined by a resource there. Um, so our standard bike lanes are five feet, so four foot would not meet that standard. Um, and so that we are proposing eight for this project. Um, but as proposed from the property owner, four feet would not uh, allow enough room for safe bicycle uh, usage and pedestrians and the vehicles passing. Can you give us your name for the record, please? Uh, Carl Dreher, uh, North Region Project Development. Thank you. Okay, so we have some speakers representing the owners here. Can you come forward, please? Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Rachel Corona. And Mark Carroll, property owners. And we also have Charlie Hooper. Hello, my name's Charlie Hooper, thank you. And thank you for taking the time or to hear us today. We appreciate it. And um, would like to thank Director Branson for your help, as well as um, Mr. Remedios. Thank you, we appreciate it. Uh, let's see, so um, just to jump in kind of where Caltrans left off um, since, you know, you were just talking about bicycles. Um, one thing to note when I was looking at the project information that has been submitted to the commission when um, it was initiated, I don't know the technical name, maybe it's a project report or something like that, that is presented to you uh, by Caltrans. Um, in that report, they specifically talk about bicycles um, on this roadway and say that there aren't, there isn't any bicycles on the roadway. So it was in their initial report, um, they basically said it's not a, a heavily bicycled roadway, and we can attest to that. <laughs> so I'm just throwing it out there. I just don't want you to walk away thinking that, you know, this is, a heavily bicycled um, highway. So, so we're here today because the state of California Department of Transportation has not designed the project in accordance with federal laws, California state laws, and has not followed California De uh, Department of Transportation policies. As a result, the project is not planned in a manner that is most compatible with the greatest good, public good, and least private injury. Oh, next slide. County government. Nevada County Board of Supervisors and Nevada County Transportation Commission have asked Caltrans to complete 13 items regarding the project design and process. Two of the items have been par uh, partially addressed. And you'll notice on these slides at the bottom, there's a little index of the items that are following for each section. Um, the Nevada County Transportation Commission and Board of Supervisors have questions and reservations about the project. As recently as July 24th of this year, the Nevada County Transportation Commission held a special meeting um, invited Caltrans to the meeting um, uh, with the 
Save Highway 174 community group to hear updates with regards to their progress in working with Caltrans on uh, design changes to this project. As a result of that, the Nevada County Transportation Commission wrote a letter to Caltrans and it's included in this package. Uh, Charlie Hooper has been working closely with the local government agencies. So um, when we get further down into, uh, you know, through our property information, um, we'd like to have him come back and speak a little bit more in detail with regards to um, the conversations that they've had with the local government. So moving on to visual impact and scenic corridor. Highway 174 is recognized as one of the most scenic and historically rich highways in the Sierra Nevada foothills and is designated a county scenic corridor and eligible for a state highway scenic or state scenic highway. The next page shows an example of the beautiful highway that we travel every day coming home. The next page has an example of the impacts uh, this project will have. So you'll see that trees on both sides of the road will be removed. They will be cutting into the bank. Um, down below is a street section of the cut. You can see with the dotted line where Caltrans is coming in and shifting the road uh, towards the bank, which will cause trees to be removed. They're also, while they're shifting the road over, they're still removing trees on the opposite side of the road because of the expanded width of the road section. And you'll note on this street section, if you look on the right side, there um, they have the edge of pavement, but then they have a seven to 20 foot slope section. And then beyond that, they have a 17 to 34 foot section of clearing before you get to the edge of right away. So it's a significant, it's more than just a, you know, two 20 foot lanes and an eight foot shoulder. And, you know, it, it's, it's a more involved project. Additionally, on this section, you can see there's a dotted line where they're raising the elevation of the road. So they're cutting into the bank, changing the horizontal curve, and raising the vertical elevation. The next page is just another example of what we see, and another example of how it will be impacted by this project. It, and again, excuse me. It, May I ask yes, a quick question? Is this your property? This is on our way to the property. But it's not your property. It's not our property. This is not the subject of this hearing. Correct. Well, I would contend that it is the subject of this hearing because I'm involved. I live in this community. Thank you. And, okay. and I, I see this every day. So this is an impact to me. This is why we bought to be and live where we are. So... The next slide shows the same street section, but it also has you know, additional trees that will be removed. So moving on. So this is right by our property. It's at our neighbors going past us. It's at our driveway. You go to the next page or next page. So even in this flat area where, I mean, we have you know, it's, it's a long, straight away stretch. Um, the widening of the road, the road will be shifted over. On this area, it'll be shifted probably 30 to 35 feet over into this pasture, which is our neighbors. And all of the trees, even on the, even on the opposite side of the road, so they're moving the road over, but they're still taking trees on both sides of the road. Again, we have you know, a wide strip that's going to be created here, and it's a straightaway. Can, can we ask you maybe, I know you're um, trying to be 
comprehensive in your discussion, but can we go to your specific we're property that we're asked to move? The on? next slide. Okay, thank you. So, the next slide regarding noise. So, Caltrans is contending that there is no noise impact to our property because I don't really understand why, but there isn't. They're shifting the road 25 feet onto our property. They're shifting the road even further onto our neighbor's property. I'm gonna back up. So if you look at our neighbor's property, it's wide open and it's flat and then it goes up. So both of, the, both of our homes sit up. Noise travels up. So it's not just if there is no trees, it doesn't mean, I mean, because there is no trees being removed or it's far away, our house is far away from the road, does not mean that we will not have impact. We currently do have impact from the road onto our home already. And it's, I mean, it's not the most quiet road, but we still love where we live. You wanna keep it that way. So um, with regards to noise, um, we believe that Caltrans has not um, categorized this project properly in their environmental studies. So according to the federal regulation, section 23, there are three different types of roads related to impact studies of noise. One is a type one project, which includes physical alteration of existing highway where there is either a substantial horizontal alterca alteration, a project that, in, that has the distance between the traffic noise source and closest receptor, substantial vertical alteration, a project that removes shielding, therefore exposing line of sight between the receptor and the traffic noise source. This is done by either altering the vertical alignment of the highway or by altering the topography between the highway and the nose noise source. Type two is not something that is related to this project. Type three is anything that is not a type one or type two project. So the next page basically talks about what the initial study says in relationship to noise. And the reason I'm bringing this up is I think Caltrans should be required to do a noise study on this project, not just for our property, I, I truly believe they do, um, but the entire pro project for the good of all. So the initial study talks about reconstructing the entire road bay, bay at bed at most or all vertical curb adjustment locations, realigning several horizontal curves and adjusting vertical curve lengths. Caltrans there, um, had originally said in their pre presentation prior that they were going, I guess they had planned on 1,700 trees being removed, but they've gotten that down to 500 or whatever the number was. The issue is, is that the environmental study that was done, I mean, I think it's great that they've gotten down to, you know, the 500 and reduced the number of trees, but the environmental study and not conducting the, the study in accordance with the CFR 23 um, and doing a noise study is not accurate. They, it, it is a type one project. And according to the Federal Highway Administration, I contacted Celia, Cecilia Ho with Federal Highway Administration just to kind of get clarification with regards to a type one project versus a type three project. And I asked her, you know, specifically, what is considered shielding? Because a type one project says that you can't remove shielding from the, um, you know, with the project and have it impact a, a source, which is a home. So basically, She's saying that a type one project is anything that removes shielding between the noise source and the re receptor. Shielding can be removed by elevating a roadway, by removing a hill or other structure, 
that results in a line of sight between traffic and the receptor. So you tell me they're removing, they had, when they did the study, they were going to remove 1,700 trees. We have 52 homes that they're acquiring right away along this road. And it's, they're saying that they are not impacting any shielding on any home on this project. That's just not the case. It can't be. So then I asked her to provide examples of type three projects or project activities. Type three projects, this is her response. Our, our project, our type three projects are not expected to have a noise impact on nearby receptors. Examples of type three projects include installing sidewalks or bike paths, construction of all electronic tolling where vehicles do not slow or stop, construction of a turn lane, operational changes such as adding a stoplight in place of a stop sign. It's a lot different than reconstructing an entire 1.9 segment of a highway and taking out in their environmental study 1,700 trees. The next slide is just a, an, an example of shielding. You know, Cecilia Ho had mentioned typically um, they don't consider shielding trees. Well, this is an example of. But this is not your parcel, right? I understand. But okay. I'm, so I'll try to move on. We can only consider today your parcel. Okay. So then what I would ask the, I would ask the commission to consider with regards to noise is that for us, this project hasn't been designed in a manner that is for the good of all and for us because they haven't complied with federal laws. And according to the Federal Highway Administration, the Federal Highway Administration shouldn't be funding projects that have not been in compliance with the law. Off-site drainage. The project adversely impacts off-site drainage on our property. So we hired McCann Somps Engineering to take a look at um, the drainage study that was provided by Caltrans. Um, so their, their project, their property impacts in their letter says, and I'll just read it real quick, Quill Point Lane, it has a minor increase in flow for these storm events on the driveway crossing. The driveway currently experiences upstream ponding with occasional inundation in storm events. Although the impact is minor, any increase in peak flow on the driveway crossing will increase the frequency that the driveway will overtop and experience wear flow. This adverse impact should be mitigated prior to discharging into a neighboring property, which is us. And as a standard, engineers don't design or shouldn't design projects that adversely impact offsite uh, anything offsite. In our discussions with Caltrans, they have said that they will not address this because it has not been in, um, addressed in their environmental study. We brought this to Caltrans's attention in November of last year, and um, you know, basically said it needs to be addressed. Nothing has nothing happened. Um, we, um, Caltrans has offered to pay us so we could upsize the drainage and handle it ourselves. That would require a permit with California Department of Fish and Wildlife and Placer County. So I called California Department of Fish and Wildlife and asked them what would it take to permit, you know, to upsize our culvert. So what uh, Amy Kennedy at the California De Department of Fish and Wildlife said is that we would have to upsize that culvert to a 100-year flood event. So the problem with that, and we'd have to do biological studies, and we'd have to have it engineered you know, to, to properly size it. The problem with that is, if you go to the next page, this is our condition. So we call it Lake Mary. And Lake Mary, Mary Johnson, who is next door to us, 
she doesn't have a problem with, you know, it, it ebbs and flows. This happens in heavy rain events. It's an annual thing that happens where the water kisses the driveway and, you know, she fills up. So if we go and if we have issues, they're, in, they're off-site drainage. He said 0.2 cubic feet per second, but it's actually 0.3 cubic feet per second. And if we have issues where it starts flowing over our driveway, we go to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. They require us to upsize it to a 100-year flood event. What's going to happen? That water is going downstream. So it's going to be our liability to deal with what happens downstream. So we've asked Caltrans. We've, we've you know, they've, they've tried to work with us on this. Um, but we don't want the exposure for what would happen downstream. So um, that's, the, that's kind of where we're at. Caltrans doesn't want to address it because it wasn't studied. And I would say that there is a process in CEQA that allows Caltrans to do a supplemental report to their environmental document to study this area so they can address it. And that's what we're asking that Caltrans do. Visual glare. <clears throat> The road is being realigned closer to homes, which will require the removal of existing tree and vegetation shielding. We don't have any trees being removed. Caltrans, you know, showed the distance of the glare from the hill. We also have this open space in the front of our property where on, on our neighbor, and we do have visual, you have lights at night that come up and into our property. Um, I'm not saying we don't have the issue now, because we do, but my concern is, is you're moving the road closer to our home and it's going to impact it. One thing that we've asked Caltrans to do is to keep the reverse curve that is in place. It's not a huge curve, it's, a, it's, a, it's you can see it in the photo, it's not a big old curve which would keep them off of our property, is, you know, to, to back it off of our property. Um, they, they're not willing to consider that. And then this is another example of shielding, but it doesn't sound like you want to hear about that because it's not on our property, but, yeah. but it's there and it exists. So I'm going to skip on the safety data. <laughs> we wanted to talk about some additional information, but it sounds like the commission is only interested in hearing items that are directly re related to our project. Um, I would contend that everything on this project is related to us because this is our community and this is what we see every day. One additional thing that I would like to bring up is process. So there's a process with regards to the resolution of necessity. And Caltrans has not followed that process. Um, we wrote a letter to the commission. And um, well, actually, before that, I called the Caltrans right away agent and ask questions with regards to the letter that we received to come to this meeting. Her response to me, because I was asking, is this related to the project or is it related to our house? You know, how, how, do, how does this work? And she said, well, you're not planning on submitting anything, are you? And I said, well, you know, well, I don't know, because I didn't know. And she said, and I said, why? And she said, well, you don't want to do that because it'll delay the project. So, I don't know how many people show up to this thing, but I would guess that maybe not many do. So, with regards to the procedures, according to the right-of-way uh, project development procedures manual, 
there are mandor mandatory procedural requirements. When they use the word must, it means that it's a mandatory procedure. And it says that the procedures must be followed with regards to resolution of necessity. So at the resolution of necessity first level meeting, the director of Caltrans should have attended and we should have received written responses, clear, concise, and complete responses to all of our concerns. That didn't happen. What happened was we sat around a table and, you know, it was, it was a nice, uh, Roger, or Roger, Carl Dreyer was in attendance, um, the head engineer uh, for the project, our right-of-way agent, and the right-of-way agent's boss. So, John, um, so it was, it was in a very structured meeting. Anyway, the bottom line is, is Carl, every, you know, when we brought up safety concerns, which we did, his response to us is, it's safety. You know, we wanted to have them reduce the impact, reduce the road. And he said they wouldn't, and we said why, and he said safety. That is the word, I mean, we've just gotten that, and that's all we've gotten safety every project's different and safety you bring up noise we, they've never provided us a written piece of information until we saw this report that was provided to you a couple weeks ago um they haven't they never addressed noise the only thing we've seen about noise is what they provided in this presentation that somebody did some kind of calculation with regards to noise it's the first time Anybody, we've heard Caltrans say that. We've gone through the level one, level two meeting, none of it. Um, level two meeting. So there should be enough time between meetings. According to the procedures, there needs to be adequate time between the level one and level two meeting so that the Caltrans has enough time to prepare and properly address concerns at the level two meeting. Before we even had our level one meeting, the right away agent was calling trying to schedule the level two meeting for the following week. It's because they have a project and it's on, they need to keep it on schedule. I mean, we were, we were just run through this process because of a schedule. That's it. They're going through the motions and they're not even following the procedures. So um, we actually were able to put that off for an additional week. She wanted to meet the week of 4th of July. We said no. And she said, well, we need to do it within two weeks. So we did it the week after the 4th of July. We show up um, prepared and according to the procedures, there's the panel and the panel chair uh, they're supposed to, Caltrans is supposed to provide a, a presentation, a, just a general, you know, here's the project. And then we're supposed to be allowed the opportunity to voice our concerns. So they did their quick presentation. I had a presentation and I said, well, we'd like, because they started talking about our concerns. And I said, well, we have a presentation. We'd like to present it. Well, the Jeff, I can't remember his last name, basically said, no, you know, we're going to go through this list of, they're going to go through the list of our concerns with us, and then we can talk about our presentation. So they proceeded to have this list, a two-page piece of paper, and just said, well, your concern is this. So the meeting is, according to the policies, should be a structured, formatted meeting which I'm assuming is for the purpose of having a, a constructive dialogue. By the time we got to our presentation, we were like so exhausted about going back and forth that we just kind of flew by it. And it like, you know, it, it was like, okay, you know, it, it was kind of useless at that point. So my point is, is that the procedures are there for a purpose. And it says they must be followed for, for a purpose. The laws are there for a purpose. 
they need to be followed. And I know, you know, we're not, it, we're not the most impacted property, but they didn't follow the law. They need to follow them. Caltrans, the state of California, is the lead agency. They need to follow the laws. I do it every day. If there's something that comes, I work in the construction industry. I've dealt with environmental issues when you start construction or before you start construction. Stuff happens. Projects get delayed. You have to do the right thing. In those cases, we're dealing with other lead agencies. Caltrans is lead agency and they approve their own plans. So we're asking the committee to have Caltrans go back and evaluate the drainage on our property. However, they can do it in a supplemental evaluation and address it. We're also asking that the commission ask Caltrans to abide by the law and go back and properly designate this as a type one project as it should be. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have questions? Any questions? Can I just add? Here? Yes. So, um, will you state your name again, oh, please, yeah. just for the record? Yeah, Charlie Hooper. Thank you. So, I think this is a bit of a different situation. And your relationship, Charlie, to this homeowner or this issue? Oh, Who are I'm, you representing? I'm a homeowner on this stretch of road where the a project is taking place, and I'm part of the Save Highway 174 group that Mr. Whiteside mentioned um, that Caltrans has been dealing with. And you've reached an agreement already on your property? I'm actually not on the, on the highway. I'm set back on a side road. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I expect that this situation is a little bit different than, they're used, than you're used to dealing with, with resolutions of necessity. And... As you may be aware, the um, county government in, in Nevada County, um, and I mean the Board of Supervisors and the Nevada County Transportation Commission, have some serious um, reservations and issues and concerns about this project. Um, and we can see that in the, the, um, the unanimously passed uh, Board of Supervisors resol resolution and the letter by the Nevada County Transportation Commission to Caltrans and Rachel has already gone over a number of the points that the county is concerned about. But I did want to just talk about, um, very briefly, three other things. One is the safety data. Caltrans used what ended up being a not very representative set of safety data to justify this project. And if you look over a longer period of time, this road is entirely safe. And we, um, we've talked to the CHP. The CHP agrees with that. And in, in addition, Caltrans has, subsequent to this study, done a speed study in the area and came to the conclusion that the road is safe and the speed should be increased with no changes to the road. Mm -hmm. So Caltrans is actually agreeing with us that the road is safe. Um, and the only two fatal collisions on this road have been drivers who were under the influence but there's two other things we're asking. One is Caltrans is removing a lot of trees for this project. We're asking Caltrans to do a tree survey because Nevada County um, has in its general plan the protection of black oak heritage trees and groves. And we would like Caltrans to do a tree survey so that Madam we Chair, could try to protect this these is, trees this is not, construction. This is not relevant to, to their run. You, you, you're, you're bringing up the whole project. That's, that's not what's before us today. I'm sorry. Okay, can I just add one more point? Okay. If it's specific to the it's project. It's very specific, which is the city manager in Grass Valley has been complaining about this project that Caltrans is not following county design standards for driveways and side roads. And he's, he's brought it up with Caltrans, and there's been no response. Specific to this parcel? specific to the project. But to this parcel, today in front uh, of us is know, one parcel. I, I think we're good. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you for your time. Thank you. Okay. So, Caltrans or Terry, I'll turn it back to you. I don't know. Mark, did you want to speak? The other property owner? I, was, I just wanted to speak on behalf of their presentation because their presentation, I believe, is about our property. And okay. they did a video of the entire road. And I'm here to tell you that was a staged bicyclist. There are no bicycles on this road. We're horse properties. There are hundreds of horse properties in this valley. So I think they cleverly had someone go before the camera. And they also showed you a video of the entire roadway. They mentioned safety for school buses. We checked the school bus schedules. There are no school bus stops on our road. There are no pedestrians. Their drainage that's insignificant amounts to over 8,000 gallons an hour going through our and over our driveway. That's why it's an issue. They have the traffic study, which affects our property. A traffic study done that's the, their burying that says that they want to increase the speed limit to 50 miles an hour. If it's a safety project, that's a concern. It also, they changed a passing lane in front of our driveway and increased it, uh, I'll say downstream by 200 feet. So now if it's a safety project, why are they having car vehicles pass in front of our property on the straightaway? They say it's to align curves. Our property is on the straightaway. The purpose of their project is to take 16 feet of additional asphalt and call it safety. There are no bicycles. They don't need the eight feet. If you go to the California legislature, they say they should address scenic highways, and it's a significant factor in designing a road. They, they don't care about the scenic impact. The compensation liability, you asked about that, uh, Ms. Burke. They want to push the liability onto us for that drainage. Highway Patrol said that the safety factor on this road right now is 0 .00003 for fatalities. It is not a safety project. If you have any questions specifically to our property and our loss, I'd be more than happy to address them, but I'm not sure if that's necessary at this point. Okay, do we have any questions? Okay, I think we're good. Yes, so thank you. Commissioner, staff has reviewed the project details um, related to this project and related to this property, and staff would recommend your approval of this resolution of necessity. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Alvarado, a second by Commissioner Gometti. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? That motion carries. Okay, we're going to move on to item four, unless the mayor has arrived, and I don't see Teresa to know. So we'll go to item four and let us know when we should go back to two, please. So item four, approval of the minutes. We have a motion by Commissioner Dunn, a second by Commissioner Tavaloni. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Abstaining. That motion carries. Item five, Commissioner Meetings for Compensation. We have a motion by Commissioner Tavaloni, a second by Commissioner Dunn. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Abstain. That motion carries. Commission Executive Director Susan Branson. Commissioners, uh, my report today is a little bit longer than usual. I wanted to start by welcoming Acting Director Bob Franzoy here today. Um, and it's great to have you here. And um, Commissioners, um, 
Director Franzoya comes with a wealth of experience. I know many of you already know him. Uh, I have been thankful to work with him in his previous roles. And um, I just really am thankful he's here and look forward to working with him further. And um, Secretary uh, David Kim will be here later uh, today, but um, I have also had an opportunity to have several meetings with him. And um, I think, you know, we are um, really blessed to have him in this appointment. He brings forward a wealth of expertise and knowledge. Uh, just really as we look out into the future with his his experience working at with so many different uh, positions at the federal level as well as in private sector, but with regards to innovation and um, technology among you know many other areas. So um, today, the reason why my report's a little longer, I did want to take an opportunity to make sure everyone who um, is here today reviewing knows what's coming up. We have a lot of various events that these are all the events I'm going to list are all on our website. Uh, for additional information. First, I wanted to um, just thank the panelists and the uh, moderators that helped us uh, provide such a great policy forum on July 29th in Sacramento. This forum was focused on transportation infrastructure resiliency as well as transit uh, ridership was the primary uh, focus areas. I want to take the opportunity to thank our staff, Jose Oseguera, for he did an excellent job. Thank you, Jose. As well as Yang Tao, he um, also was just right there, and I just really appreciated it. It also, putting on these forms is not easy. Garth Hopkins, Doug Remedios, Bridget Driller, but also Ed, who, I'm not seeing Ed right now, Ed, who is always our silent partner, just very grateful he's our, for those viewing, he's the one that makes sure that we have our webcast, and Gino Indo. So I just wanted to thank you um, all. And um, we have we also held a trade quarters enhancement workshop, program workshop yesterday in San Jose. I we will have future workshops coming up. But um, on Thursday, September 5th in Sacramento, we are holding a transit workshop to discuss the unique as aspects of delivering transit projects. And I wanted to thank in advance the transit experts who will be at that workshop. Um, we are also holding, on September 13th, a Road Charge Technical Advisory Committee meeting in Orange County. Um, we are grateful for um, Orange County Transportation Authority for hosting us there. And uh, we also have a Tri-State Commission meeting with Oregon and Washington on se September 16th and 17th in Stevenson, Washington. The topics there will include rural freight challenges and opportunities, rural access to jobs, industry, economic growth, Rural Emergency Access Federal Funding, and a Future of a Road Charge. Uh, commissioners, uh, the Commission is required by statute to hold hearings on the Caltrans proposed Interregional Transportation Improvement Program. We are scheduled to hold a Northern California hearing on Tuesday, October 8th in Modesto, and a Southern California hearing on Tuesday, October 5th in Southern California. Our October CTC meeting on October 9th will be in Modesto. I just want everyone to know that will be a one-day commission meeting because on Thursday, October 10th in Modesto, we are holding a joint meeting with the California Air Resources Board. The commission is also holding an active transportation policy symposium on Tuesday and Wednesday, October 29th and 30th in Sacramento, where we really intend to focus on um, how, to, how to move forward with the next cycle of funding and future cycles in addressing um, some of the recent reports that we've received, but also how to work with all stakeholders so that we can better uh, capture data and measure the performance benefits of projects in other areas. It should be a um, pretty filled couple of days. Uh, the Commission has scheduled a town hall meeting in Del Norte County on Wednesday, November 6th, and um, also wanted to uh, just i let you know that staff will uh, move forward on a workshop should the federal SAFE rule be enacted. We believe that there will be issues related to that that we all need to work on in partnership um, with the local, regional, and state agencies affected. And then lastly, commissioners, with respect to staff, I'm extremely pleased to announce that Don Chesser was promoted to a deputy director for programming. 
Dawn, you all know Dawn, but um, this is a very, um, um, you know, a very well-deserved promotion. Dawn is extremely knowledgeable. She's a proven leader. She has such a strong programming background, and um, she is so well-respected among the commission and the commission staff and all those who work with Dawn. So, um, you know, congratulations, Dawn. And also, Commissioners Amy McPherson, our, our public information officer, is leaving the commission. She's accepted a position at the California Air Resources Board to focus on um, CARB's wildlife prevention program. And um, we also, Megan Petroncelli, who is a key player uh, for us, she has done uh, so much for us on the active transportation program. Um, you know that she's pursuing a career in speech pathology. She's reached the point now where she's actually entering into the job uh, market, uh, working at a school. Thankfully, the speech pathology program is not that easy to complete everything, so there will be a little bit of time that she'll be off and on able to still help us out. <laughs> so, um, Megan, we're just grateful to you for all that you've done for the commission. And um, Justin Hall is a new hire as a staff services analyst. He um, is not here today. You'll meet him eventually. But he's going to work on our website accessibility, our budgets, contract, and procurement. He does have a bachelor's degree in business administration with a focus in marketing at CSU Fullerton. And lastly, I wanted to take the opportunity to just really thank Doug Remedios for all that he does for the commission, myself, and the commission staff. Don't know how we would put on all of the events that I just listed and all the event events that you've seen us hold over the years. We could not do it without Doug, and I'm, I'm truly grateful. Commissioners, oh, thank you. <laughs> And commissioners, that, and he is not leaving. He is not leaving. <laughs> uh, commissioners, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions for our director? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to item seven, commissioner reports. Commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Dan. Uh Just following on uh, Ms. Branson's report, um, uh, Susan and I met with Secretary David Kim and Undersecretary Alyssa Konove to talk uh, uh, an update on the Road Charge Technical Advisory Committee, where our past has been, what he might be seeing as secretary for the future. And he's walking in as, like, on oh, cue. Wow. It was Perfect. like you heard your name. name. So uh, it was a, a, a very positive meeting, and we look forward to working with uh, the secretary and his team. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone, any other commissioners? I just have a little to add. Um, Director Branson and Garth and I attended the Asilomar Air Quality and Transportation Conference in July, so pleased to have the opportunity to meet with a number of folks whose focus is primarily on the air quality issues that we all collectively are working to solve together. And then I participated in the SEED Conference, which is another group looking at solving uh, the nexus with transportation, along with uh, Commissioner Burke joined me at that one. So. That's what I have to report. So no further reports. We are going to go to Secretary Kim and welcome. And David, you might see another familiar face out in the audience, former highway, uh, Federal Highway Administrator Greg Nadeau is up there. So Greg, welcome to California. And it's a reunion for you. David, thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, really appreciate uh, the chance to speak. This is my first commission meeting. Uh, I've been on the job for six weeks, started on July 1st, and it's been a whirlwind during that time. Um, have had a chance to go to a couple of groundbreaking ceremonies, uh, one in San Diego, SR11, Otay Mesa East, Port of Entry, uh, as well as the I-5 HOV project in Sacramento. And what I really want to do during the first, during the early part of my tenure is, is to um, do a series of listening sessions around the state. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of being in LA, Orange County. Uh, Commissioner Dunn had a chance to visit her organization, OCBC, along with Mobility 21, and also some time in the Bay Area. And I see Therese McMillan here in the audience had a chance to visit with her at MTC. And uh, those listening sessions will, will continue uh, during the course of the next few months. It's really my goal to visit every region of the state and speak to as many stakeholders, 
local governments, MPOs, transit agencies as possible, uh, because we're all in this together, and the, we all know that the challenges are great, and uh, I'm here to listen and to learn. And so um, with that, thank you so much. I look forward to working with all of you. I know some of you on the commission. I don't know others, but I look forward to meeting all of you and getting to know you and working with um, also commission staff and all of our stakeholders at the lo in local level, cities, counties, MPOs, transit agencies. And so um, thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Secretary Kim? So welcome. And David, I do appreciate the fact that you were reaching out to all of our various reaches of our state, so to speak, and the commission prides itself on moving our meetings around and also on having our town halls. So uh, glad to have you joining, joining us on the road because I think it's important for all of us. So thank you. Yes, and I'm, I'm, I'm remiss in not recognizing my former boss, Greg Nato. I don't know where you are, Greg, but I think you're up there somewhere. Oh, there you are. Okay. Uh, as you know, Greg was Federal Highway Administrator and I was his Deputy Administrator. Uh, during the during the Obama years, so uh, great to see you, Greg. Great, thank you. Okay, so Therese McMillan, where's Therese? Is the mayor here? No, no mayor yet. Okay, there must be some traffic between Sacramento and San Jose today. So we'll keep moving on our agenda, and we'll go to item number nine, our Caltrans director, and welcome, Bob. We're Delighted to have you with us. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, my name is Bob Franzoya. I'm the acting director of Caltrans. Uh, I'm on the job the same length of time that Secretary Kim is. And uh, uh, David um, graciously offered me the opportunity to be designated uh, as acting director. He didn't tell me that we we're going to get two earthquakes uh, three days, four days into um, our, our terms. Um, but I am uh, honored. I'd like to cover. Uh, Three quick points. Um, regarding the uh, United States Department of Transportation Infrastructure for Rebuilding America grant program, uh, California, specifically the city of Temecula, is being awarded a $50 million grant to construct a two-lane northbound collector distribution system along I-15 uh, from the Westchester Road, Winchester Road, excuse me, I-15 interchange to the I-15, I-215 junction. Uh, this project will generate uh, regional economic mobility and safety benefits via time um, travel savings, safety and emission savings. Many thanks to uh, the Federal Highway Administration for their support. Um, second, our Independent Office of Audits and Investigations Audit Report on Caltrans Efficiencies Report. Um, the audit, uh, Independent Office of Audit Investigations provided Caltrans management their verification audit of the Caltrans 2017-18 efficiency report. The audit found that the efficiencies were supported and that the department has developed a methodology to determine whether savings related to value analysis and construction manager general contractor will result in actual savings in the future. The Independent Office of Audits and Investigations also provided constructive recommendations to our project delivery division as well as the SB1 program manager. The verification audit is posted on the office's website, and we'll continue to work with them on their findings and recommendations leading up to the next verification audit. Uh, I mentioned the uh, Ridgequake earthquakes. Um, less than a week after being designated acting director, there were a series of quakes, with magnitude 7.1 being the largest. I was extremely impressed with the efforts by Caltrans and the California Highway Patrol to clear rock slides, inspect for damage, and complete emergency road repairs while ensuring motorist safety. Permanent repairs on State Route 178 were contracted and completed in a matter of days. We were fortunate. These were sizable quakes, but there were no fatalities and our structures held up well. It's been some years since California had earthquakes of this magnitude. It was going back and um, it's been uh, Northridge, 1994, um, our most recent one, which was a 6.7. Um, this seismic activity uh, has, ironically, uh, proven to be an, an invaluable opportunity to review the Caltrans system standards and processes. Uh, in particular, I anticipate significant improvements in district to district and district to headquarters communications coming from our efforts. Um, later in your near agenda, you'll hear from District Director 9, Brent Green, who will provide a presentation from a ground level perspective on the department's earthquake response and recovery actions. 
I think you'll be happy with the report. I would just like to take one moment to say thank you to Secretary Kim, to uh, Undersecretary Alyssa Konoff for their support, and a particular shout out to the Caltrans staff. They have been fantastic. It has been an absolute joy to work with everyone. Uh, I've said this before, that uh, they have gone out of their way to make me look good. And lots of times that's hard work. And I appreciate every effort that they've made. Thank you very much. We have any questions? Thank you very much for your report. Okay, so now we are going to go to Federal Highways, item number 10. Vince. I've got the red carpet going. Brought your former big boss in here. Now behave yourself today. So it is rare that I'm in, a, in the presence of two of my former bosses. So I'd like to let you know right now, I really don't care. <laughs> so, I don't care what you think. You were wrong about everything. Now, David, great working with you. I'm looking forward to working with you in the future. Greg, Greg I don't care. You're done. Bob, it's been great working with you. Thank you. Yeah, that was kind of ugly coming down that stairs. Sorry about that. It'll look better going up. Uh, welcome, David. We appreciate uh, We're glad to have you here in California. I had a, a long working relationship with David, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to that continuing. We've already had some uh, things we've been dealing with. Uh, it's great. I love the interview process that you do in California, where when you put somebody in an acting job, you shake the earth, or you throw a mudslide, <laughs> or you do something different. So, Bob, congratulations on good job through that first interview. Um, uh, I do. I, I really appreciate it. I had some conversations with Bob very early on that, just so you know. Uh, day after, uh, just very calm, very deliberate, very open, trying to figure out what's happening, understanding the process, looked for, saw a couple opportunities where we might be able to improve the process, so I appreciated that, that whole approach to that. Uh, and, and in continuing with how we work between the director of Caltrans and myself, you stole a lot of my talking points, so nice work there. Um, check, check, check. So we already talked about the infra grant that we have in Temecula. Uh, the build grant process, we're in the process of evaluating that right now. Uh, that's, those, those were done in July, so we'll be going through that process. And again, those are just, you know, hey, is there any major issue there? Is the funding set? Those types of things. So those are the types of things I would encourage everybody as you're doing grants to make sure you have those types of things lined up and, uh, and are clear. Um, NEPA, NEPA assignment so we don't have NEPA delegation in California we have NEPA assignment so the discussion it struck me the discussion that you had earlier on the resolution of necessity any comment just so everybody knows any comment that Federal Highway ever makes on any project in California other than a border other than a couple few specific ones are general in nature so we are very conscious of not saying, here, let me look at what you have mm -hmm. and saying, nope, that should have been this, that should have been that, that is not our place. Mm -hmm. um, you've just gotten your approval for a waiver of so sovereign immunity with no sunset, from what I understand. The governor signed that recently, which means you will be defending that in federal court. So federal highway, we won't even be brought in as witnesses in something like that. The first, anytime we get sued on something like that, our first move is to get removed from that lawsuit because Caltrans owns that. Uh, so I want to make sure anytime, and I'm not saying they were implying that they said Federal Highway said in this particular. When Federal Highway speaks on environment in California, it is very general in nature. It isn't specific to any particular project. It's something we're very conscious because by law, I'm not allowed to weigh in. That's not our place. We have no authority to do that. Uh, and I believe congratulations with High Speed Rail also got waiver, I mean, got the NEPA assignment also, if I understood that correctly. So. Um, that's California is the example of uh, where everybody's going, I think. California has requested $900 million in August redistribution. So we're, that, remember last year, I think we got more than 19 states got uh, in their whole program. So we're hoping for a healthy one, but keep open the floodgates. We're still trying to open the floodgates. Um, so their request <laughs> for $900 million, uh, So hopefully that'll be another uh, large chunk coming here to California. Repurposed earmarks. Periodically, we talk about the, so we have 2016, uh, Congress has allowed us in our Appropriations Act to repurpose earmarks that weren't used. Um, we will probably have a few of those laps in California with good reason. So some of those earmarks came with obligation authority also. So you have a limitation and then that, that California can spend. And then if they add an earmark, sometimes they'll add some limitation with that. 
and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they do an earmark and say, here's your earmark, but you got to use the money you've been using. So those ones that came with limitation, I think uh, Cal California is will be repurposing all of those. And the ones that don't come with, uh, with limitation, they're evaluating whether or not that's a project they want to use their formula fund for, if that makes sense. And if it doesn't, good, then I'm the only one that knows about it. So he, he, he. Um, and then, uh, so that, that's a good solid thing. The inactive obligations were a little bit high right now. Uh, we are doing, we're going to be working with Caltrans to do a review of timely obligation of funds. So one of the things you'll hear me talk about is spending the federal dollars, getting it, on the, getting it out on the street very quickly. Uh, so we're going to be working with Caltrans to review that process to get projects from federal authorization to spending money as quickly as possible, just to see if there's any mechanical challenges that are involved in there, both with the federal, I mean, with the state and the local programs. Two more things. DBE, I keep talking about how great we're moving in DBE. I remember 10 years ago when I got here, and David, I think you and I talked about this in your previous role. We were at 1.9 or 2.0. Uh, we are at. We have a goal now of 17.6. We're at 18.7, which means we're below our goal. Huge accomplishment to get to 16.8, but we still got to get there. So I'm looking, That's this is the discussion, everybody behind me, to make sure you're holding your contractors to your goal, to the goals on contracts, make sure you're setting the goals on contracts aggressively, uh, and make sure you're awarding contracts to contractors that are meeting your DBE goals. Lastly is tribes. I know there's a lot of involvement with tribes here in California. I know District 1's got a lot of outreach and some of the other districts are doing that. I wanna keep continuing to encourage um, discussion with tribes and making sure we're meeting with uh, tribes in California. Uh, we have 109. Uh, federally recognized tribes here in California, and they belong at the table. Uh, so we're hoping and making sure, and that's my job to make sure that they are at the table. So we're going to be reaching out to some tribal communities um, just to kind of see how we can do a better job of reaching out to that. That was in the interest of time. That's all I got. Can I ask you a question? Only if your mic is on. If you're going to yell at me, leave the mic off. <laughs> well... <coughs> I guess I could say something in Italian, but I won't. <laughs> it's all right. I wouldn't understand it. <laughs> we appreciate the fifty million that we got on on uh, from the feds, and I was telling a lot of folks what you were going to do for us on the other couple hundred million on the two forty one and the seventy one and all of those. Can you tell me? why and how you fell down on that that we didn't get it. well there's a lot of reasons <laughs> on how i fail you and it's this is going to take a few drinks and a couple of bottles of wine to cover all of the reasons where i fail you i'd be more than happy to buy that but, i'm looking but, for <laughs> so it doesn't happen again <laughs> that's I, I i get that too it's a it's a very challenging process um uh with the infra grant we're hoping we're going to get some more here in california um it's 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 all of DOT. There's a lot of different types of projects, and a lot of people are involved in that. That's the only thing I could say. I get you. And a little bit of politics. I get it. And I, I'm not here to speak on that. Thank I'm you. I, I didn't think you would. That's not what I do. <laughs> you answered my question. Thank you. There you go. Any other questions for Vince? So, Vince, you talked about timely obligations. We kind of feel the same way with some of our reimbursements from you all. So, you know, I know it's not your... In which area? Well, all of the above. Anywhere no, you owe us money. No, all the reimbursements Let's... except for ER. All the other reimbursements are there. <laughs> okay. Where's all our FEMA other money and everything? ER, where it's there. No, I'm not FEMA. <laughs> I know, but those are your cousins. <laughs> Man, this is getting... Susan, take her out. No, you're not going to come. Gonna... <laughs> Thanks, Vince. All right. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to go back to item number two, and we have joining us today Therese McMullen uh, from MTC and formerly from Metro and formerly from F or FRA, FTA, FTA, right. yeah, right. and formerly from MTC, and I fall off your bio after that, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Chair Inman, and uh Welcome, commissioners. Uh, I am delighted to be here as part of the Welcome to the Bay Area message that will be delivered by Mayor Sam Licardo. 
Um, but I wanted to sneak in a bit and briefly introduce myself in my new role as the executive director of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. As was noted, I had worked for them for some time, for 25 years. But most recently was before you when I had just joined LA Metro as the chief planning officer and um, was delighted to work with you and the CTC staff in that capacity. But now I'm back here in the Bay and am thrilled to be able to introduce Mayor Sam Licardo. Um, the mayor is also a commissioner on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and is helping us shepherd not only the extraordinarily complex uh, problems and solutions in public transport here in the Bay Area. And you'll be hearing about one of those, the 101 um, Express Lanes project today. But importantly, critical parallel issues such as housing, where we're seeing the intersections of these issues affect how people move and by then extension, how we need to deal with those problems. So I'd like to introduce the mayor and um, just say I'm really pleased to be able to work for him in my new capacity. Well, good afternoon. Yeah. And a belated welcome to San Jose. Uh, it's good to be with you. You undoubtedly know why we are so grateful and proud to have Teresa McMillan as our executive director of the MTC. And uh, uh, to uh, Chairperson Inman and commissioners, I hope uh, you will enjoy uh, your time here in San Jose. Uh, perhaps get outside and enjoy our bike lanes. We have a, uh, a, a suitable electric bike share bike or scooter with your name on it. Uh, I have just returned from Sacramento, uh, where I was testifying on a Senate subcommittee and thought I had escaped the heat of the valley on the 680 express lanes, but in fact, I realize I found it here as well. Uh, but I want you to know that San Jose, uh, here and throughout the Bay Area, we are very appreciative of you. And yes, we're also appreciative of your money. Uh, we have several <laughs> projects underway uh, that have relied on your good judgment and the dollars that you allocate. Uh, and I'd like to tell you about just a couple of those. Uh, one very important one, uh, in just a few months, we will be celebrating uh, the opening of the first BART station in the Bay Area's largest city, connecting San Jose with the rest of the Bay Area. Uh, 200, I'm sorry, $730 million of TIRCP funds uh, enabled that project to move forward along with no fewer than four local and regional ballot measures, all of which were led by one of your fellow commissioners, Carl Guardino. We're grateful, certainly, for his leadership. Uh, this project is coming in $100 million under budget. How often do we hear that in government? And uh, certainly, we believe this is just a, detour, a momentary stop on what we know is the ultimate destination. We're trying to get all the way through downtown San Jose and on to Santa Clara. So we will continue building with your help. Uh, we also have a very significant project uh, underway here just next door near Deerdon Station, the electrification of Caltrain connecting uh, San Francisco, uh, San Jose, and points south. $165 million of TIRCP funds will enable that line to run quieter and cleaner. More than 65,000 daily riders. It's bursting at the seams. We have, I should say, Caltrain has, and we support a very ambitious business plan to bring that number closer to 185,000 daily riders. And we know that will be critical for traffic congestion uh, relief as well as for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And this will be a critical spine for a future high-speed rail line as well. Uh, and uh, I think as Therese mentioned, uh, the 101 express <coughs> lanes in both Santa Clara and San Mateo counties 233 million dollars in SB1 funding, and I'm not sure if Senator Jim Bell is here, your ex officio member, uh, but if whether he is or not, I need to certainly sing his praises for his leadership on SB1. I think we, like so many residents throughout the state of California, are grateful uh, that SB1 is enabling us to move forward on that and so many other very important projects. Uh, <coughs> but here in Santa Clara County, we are big believers in self-help. We were the first county in the country to do so back in the 1970s to tax ourselves to pay for transportation improvements. Uh, and we have done so repeatedly. In fact, just a couple years ago, Measure B 2016, of course, led by Carl Gordino and the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, Regional Measure 3, 
Uh, and ahead, we have ambitions to do more uh, collectively with the nine Bay Area counties together, faster Bay Area. Uh, since about January of 2017, the leadership of several organizations spur the Bay Area Council and the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, private citizens have been working on a potential transformative transportation measure with a goal to as, as ambitious as the needs that we have in our region. Uh, we want to build and operate world-class seamless integrated transit systems that incorporates all of our systems in existence today and better serve those who are transit dependent and get a few folks who are not transit dependent out of their cars. So uh, these are big ambitions certainly, uh, but is really to tell you that we are ready and willing to be partners with you. Uh, we are not simply supplicants. We recognize that uh, local dollars are critical to make these projects move. Uh, you're undoubtedly going to hear uh, from Teresa's team and the rest of us about our uh, ideas about your next SB1 cycle. Uh, we have lots of ideas in mind around transit core capacity improvements, uh, completing our regional express lanes network, improving access to active forms of transportation, improving safety, all of our Vision Zero plans throughout the Bay Area. Uh, but here in San Jose, I just want to point, direct you to two, in closing, two very important projects to, uh, to us. Uh, first next door to us uh, here at City Hall, just a few blocks away, is a sleepy little train station called Diridon, uh, where Google is planning a five to six million square foot campus. Uh, there are currently several rail lines that intersect there at Diridon, ACE, Amtrak, Capital Corridor, Caltrain, several local lines of uh, light rail, bus rapid transit. We, of course, in the next decade, anticipate that we'll have BART, and perhaps soon, we hope, uh, high-speed rail as well. And at full build-out, this could become the busiest multimodal station in the Western United States. Uh, and we would love to make it happen with you. And more to come on that particular vision. And then finally, uh, the governor was absolutely correct when he stated several months ago that there is no money for a full <coughs> build-out of high-speed rail as is, as is currently planned. But I think the governor agrees, as I would, that $20 billion for a system that does not get from the Central Valley to job centers on the coast is $20 billion too much. And we should be doing more. And so we will be working with many partners to connect one valley to the other. The jobs of Silicon Valley uh, to the needs of the Central Valley. And indeed, the housing <coughs> opportunities in the Central Valley to what we know is a Silicon Valley in a housing crisis. We think this has multiple benefits for our entire state, and we look forward to working with you in the years ahead to bring this great ambition to life. So thank you for allowing me to intrude on your agenda, uh, and thank you for the great work you do for the people of the state of California. Thank you, Mayor. Do we have any questions for the mayor? Carl, you look like you're leaning in. <laughs> Mayor Licardo and, and Therese McMillan. Uh, Therese, first, thank you for taking this role coming back from Los Angeles. We are all so thrilled for your leadership in the nine county Bay Area and beyond. So thank you again. Mayor Licardo, thank you. You uh, humbly always give credit to others. So we first met when you volunteered about 100 hours a week to lead that first BART campaign in the year 2000. You helped That's lead. because you didn't pay very well, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were a lot of zeros in your paycheck, but it started with a zero as well. Uh, and then it didn't win. And then again in 2008 and 2016, as well as uh, 2018 with RM3, you were a critical leader in all four of those measures. I, I truly think we should change your name to Bart Licardo and make it official. So thank, thank you. you again for all that you've done, sir. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Chairperson. Yep, thank you. Appreciate you joining us. Okay, we're going to move on to item number 11, regional agencies. Bill. Well, good afternoon, Chairman and Commissioner, and also welcome Secretary Kim. Philip Chu here with San Bernardino County Transportation Authority. I'm the uh, RTPA moderator for 1920. Yvonne Garcia, should we wave your hand, Yvonne? So uh, he's with the Butte County, and he's the vice moderator for this year. 
So the RTPA group met this morning and discussed a number of topics. Uh, first off, we recognize our outgoing RTPA moderator, Luke McNeil Carrick from with the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency. The RTPA group appreciates all his work and leadership in the past year and the work that he has done in ATP and the SB1 program. So thank you, Luke. So on behalf of the RTPA group, I would also like to thank the CTC staff, thank you Teresa, uh, for all the hard work that went into the final draft of the 2020 STIP guidelines and fund estimates. The group appreciates the flexibility and suggests allowing nine months instead of the current six months and the current guidelines for contract award. Now this will allow additional time to accommodate any issues under the current bid environment for construction. Now the group is also looking forward to the next round of STIP in 2022 where we'll see the full benefit of SB1. The group received update from CTC staff on SB1 programs and noted that all the cities in California is eligible for SB1 local streets and road program for this round. The RTPA group continues to work closely with the CTC staff on various SB1 program guidelines development participating in trade corridor enhancement program and the solutions for congested corridor program workshop. We also look forward to the September 5th transit workshop to provide inputs, uh, input on guidelines development for the transit projects under various SB1 programs. The regional agency have also been working closely with Caltrans to obligate all federal apportionment that would, that would subject to rescission pending on August redistribution. We also received an update from FHWA on timely obligations and invoicing for projects. The group appreciates the update and we're looking forward to continue to working with uh, FHWA closely on this matter. This concludes my report and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions? Hearing none, thank you, Philip. We'll move on to item number 12, rural counties. Woodward. Good afternoon, Commissioners, Chair Inman, Directors Branson, uh, Franzoya, Secretary Kim, Woodrow Deloria with the El Dorado County Transportation Commission representing the Rural Counties Task Force. Um, first of all, I'd like to just thank uh, the, the former chair of the Rural Counties Task Force, Moira Toomey, who I think may have stepped out, but she, she did a, she, her exemplary leadership over the last two terms um, was, was uh, Clap for Moira. Great, great <laughs> for all of us, so thank you, Moira. And she's no longer the chair, so she doesn't oh, have to well. stick around for much longer at all. Um, the, the Rural Counties Task Force did meet on July 19th and discussed a number of issues and opportunities facing our 26 rural counties. I'd like to thank uh, Coco Bersenio from Caltrans for presenting an in-depth discussion on the Caltrans planning efforts as well as the upcoming grant opportunities. The rural counties certainly appreciate the next round of Caltrans planning grants to support the many, the many projects that we have planned to improve our rural communities. Um, we also received a presentation on the interim count methodology guidance for the active transportation program, uh, which was presented by Caltrans. As is often the case, uh, the limited staffing and resources of many of our rural counties uh, presents challenges to data collection and analytics for performance-based planning. Uh, therefore, the rural counties are, are looking into ways that we might take on a collective or shared cost approach to acquire the necessary transportation trip count tools uh, and technology that could potentially be deployed across our rural counties. And while rural, rural counties are in full support of performance-based planning, it is important uh, that we continue to work with Caltrans to ensure that the approach uh, to performance analytics for those active transportation projects does not present rural regions with an inequitable uh, burden uh, or unrealistic ex expectation. Uh, the rural counties greatly appreciate the continued coordination with Caltrans on the development of the California Transportation Plan, as well as the coordinated, uh, coordination on the critical rural freight Corridor Strategy and California Freight Mobility Plan, which were both presented at our July meeting. Uh, the Rural Performance Measure Framework was also pre presented in July. Uh, this study evaluated the, the Federal Transportation Performance Management Framework with a focus on the rural context. And our next RCTF meeting will be held in Ukiah and we'll be celebrating uh, Phil Dow, who recently retired. So we'll be celebrating in Northern California. Um, and that concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Hearing none. Thank you. Thank you, Woodrow. Okay, we're going to move on now to item 13, self-help counties. Keep <laughs> Thank 
Thank you, Madam Chair. When Keith Dunn here on behalf of the Self Help Counties Coalition, I'm pleased to report that the governor did sign, as Vince mentioned, uh, AB 252, which grants Caltrans the authority to assume the NEPA uh, delegation and also the liability associated with that. But we were, after three uh, previous efforts, able to get it through the legislature without any additional sunsets. So we will not have to revisit that in a number of years as we have in the past. So we're very excited that that process is done and that the governor moved on uh, and signed that legislation. I also like to report that we've been continuing to work with the state of California and the Department of Finance, um, the Federal uh, Aviation Administration, which has started to look at how aviation uh, sales tax on aviation fuel is spent and uh, allocated amongst the airports. They've started issuing letters uh, recently to our counties, also to the state of California, wanting to know how those monies are being directed to the airports because of a change in their policy that they've done through a regulatory process, not through statute. Um, there's legislation that's been offered through some of our California delegation in the House and then an effort in the appropriations process in the Senate that would try and shift back to the previous um, handling of that sales tax on aviation fuel for taxes that have been passed by voters. Congress has not taken that uh, out of either house as of yet. We're continuing to support those efforts and we'll see where it goes and we're trying to work with DOF. Uh, currently the state doesn't track the value, the dollar value of that, that uh, sales tax on aviation fuel and we've been told that they may require legislation um, to authorize that moving forward. So we're continuing those discussions. Letters are being issued. Uh, we're trying to comply with the letters as best we can. Uh, this this issue has been around for a number of years, and many of us submitted plans to the federal government, which sat someplace without any comment until just recently. So it seems that for whatever reason, this administration is starting to look at our compliance and the state's compliance with what they now interpret as the rule for handling sales tax on aviation fuel. So it's an ongoing issue that we're, we're monitoring and concerned with. Also, we're getting ready for Focus on the Future, which will be in San Diego uh, County this year at Coronado. Um, as many of you have attended in the past, we look forward to your participation moving forward. We always have a report that your executive director gives to the group, and we'll look forward to that again this year uh, and continuing our partnership with you in building uh, infrastructure for our state. A number of bills uh, out there, and I know that there's, you're going to go over your comments uh, later in the, in the day, uh, um, position or suggestions uh, on legislation that your staff has come up with. We're always appreciative of your efforts to improve legislation that comes out of uh, the legislature and appreciate efforts to continue our partnership working together so that we can best deliver the infrastructure that our state needs. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have on any, any issue. Any questions? What's the date of focus on the future, please? Oh, gosh. Uh, you would ask me. Uh, it's November 16th, 17th, and 18th. Thank you. Uh, and Coronado, you said. It's at Coronado at the Hotel Dell where uh, my the people that helped me put all these things together have got a great state rate. So very affordable. Thank you. Any questions for Keith? Okay. Hearing none. Thank you, Keith. We will move on now to item 14, Innovations and Transportation Garth. Yes, Commissioners, uh, TAP 14 is an informational item. Cindy Hoagland, Vice President for Government Affairs or Government Programs with Trimble Incorporated, will talk about the general benefits of digital construction. With that, I'll turn it over to Cindy. Madam Chair, Commissioners, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Carl, thank you always for, for your support and Garth as well. Trimble delivers innovative, intelligent, technology solutions enabling on-time, on-budget, and high-quality infrastructure projects. We are based in Sunnyvale, and for the past 40 years, our company has been improving our customers' productivity, profitability, working with our customers to improve the safety of the workers, working with our customers to improve the quality of infrastructure, and also providing transparency to projects from a cost and schedule perspective. And we do this through various industries. And we do this by looking at the physical world, the construction site, the farm, long haul trucking. We then connect the physical world to the digital world, 
design, monitoring, and measuring of assets. And you can save time and money if you design and you construct digitally before you break ground and construct in the real physical world. Refining the model and identifying the challenges in the digital model prior to going into the field does save time and money. In fact, most infrastructure projects have a 20% rework. Using technology allows you to reduce that rework by 50%. If we look at the SB1 budget of $5.4 billion a year, there are significant cost savings by leveraging technology. The technology exists today to drive these efficiencies and to provide the transparency and the accountability for the budgets and these schedules. Although there are challenges in the adoption and the speed of adoption of digital construction technology, the transformation is taking place. It's taking place because there is large urbanization and population growth along with aging infrastructure. And we know that there needs to be an increase of 60% in construction by 2030. Because we also have more pressure for sustainability construction that means reducing our carbon footprint on construction processes by up to 50%. We know the transformation is coming because the construction industry has lagged behind other industries in productivity. And we know that through leadership and policy change, we are moving in that direction. And also because we have a shortage in skilled labor, skilled labor to actually run the machines, labor to actually construct and labor that's needed to manage these projects. And so technology needs to have a role in automating the workflow and automating process. There's a role for augmented reality, there's a role for autonomy, and there's a role for big data that's needed as a result of this shortage in skilled labor today. And so we know that when technology is used on large infrastructure projects, that you can save time and money. States such as California recognize the benefits of digital construction technologies, such as machine control, 3D modeling, project management, construction management tools. However, leadership is needed, and in some instances, policy changes are needed in order to drive that adoption forward. Trimble and others in the industry have been encouraging lawmakers to help to accelerate this adoption so that states can take advantage of these technologies and to help get our infrastructure built faster, to connect our communities and our jobs, and to actually reduce the commutes. The return on investment is proven when you implement technology in the field today. On average, customers reduce their project delivery costs by 15 to 20% by leveraging digital construction technologies. And so this is how it works. Successful projects require integrated delivery strategies that leverage digital tools across the stakeholders, both in the office as well as in the field. With the passing of SB1, there is a need for increased efficiency and accountability on these projects. Digital construction accelerates the efficiency and the productivity for these stakeholders helping to achieve this objective. SAMTRANS, for example, is leveraging program management technology that will be utilized by Caltrans and 30 other contractors during the San Mateo 101 <coughs> Express Lanes project. Design reviews, RFIs, submittals, Price changes, change orders will all be managed through a centralized system, and it will be streamlined. The process for reviews and submittals will all be standardized, and the end result of this type of technology is further collaboration among a multitude of stakeholders, saving time and money, and helping to support project delivery. 
Contra Costa Transportation Authority is also leveraging program management type technology on their Innovate, Innovate 680 program. And infrastructure projects produce a massive amount of information, and they consume a massive amount of information, whether that's geospatial, project timelines, financial information. Add the complexity of various stakeholders involved in those projects who have their own goals and objectives, and visibility and transparency to large complex projects easily can be missed. Through machine learning and AI type tools, the analysis, the visualization, the customization of consuming all of this complex information is improving. And it's beginning to support construction process and improving construction. Government agencies as owners of this data can and should be better informed on how to benefit from this information in the field and in the office. Because data is power. And today, you can take a 3D model of a bridge. You can incorporate that into an augmented reality platform like HoloLens glasses. And your field workers and your stakeholders can all be viewing at the site, at the physical location, that bridge in a reality type environment to identify where the problems are, where the design inconsistencies are. This reduces rework, this saves on time, and this saves on money. And then data powers the IA, providing intelligent decision making for productivity and automation. We believe that this committee can help Caltrans and others to embrace digital construction technologies in order to better leverage the use of this data. Because this information, the relevance of this data, and the use of this data goes beyond the completion of the construction site and will be used to optimize the maintenance and the operation of our cities. Now, technology alone cannot address these issues from a decision-making perspective. It is a combination of people, process, and technology. And technology can be used as a measurable tool for the states and for the committee. And we would like to see states better utilize digital construction technologies and the process in order to accelerate the benefits that are available in industry today. And so finally, how can government accelerate the adoption? We can develop digital construction strategies, both internally within the agencies, as well as externally for our contractors and our partners. We can foster a culture of innovation. We can encourage the adoption to use technology. This requires leadership. This requires change in process. And in some instances, this requires policy to help to accelerate that adoption. And finally, government is the owner of many of these assets, many of these infrastructure tools. And you should ask your partners to provide access to relevant data on the project status as well as on the assets themselves so that you can leverage this information when you're managing the operations and the maintenance of those assets after construction. So in conclusion, collaboration between government and private industry is needed to achieve these benefits and to accelerate the process. And Trimble and others in the infrastructure community are here to support California and state DOTs across this nation to help to inform and support. The private sector, including our competitors, have a great deal to offer in terms of technical knowledge and our assistance with these challenges. And so public agencies simply need to ask, and we are here to help. So I thank you again for the opportunity. I would be delighted to take any call. Any questions? Thank you, Cindy. Do we have questions? Yes. Oh, Jen. Yes, Secretary Kim. 
Cindy, thank you very much for your presentation. This is really exciting stuff. And uh, one of my priorities in this role is to look at the future of transportation in California and how can we better utilize and leverage advanced technologies to bring about better mobility outcomes. And this could very well be one of those areas. Can you tell us um, a little bit more about where this technology has been deployed, either in California or outside of California, and lessons learned or um, uh, yeah, lessons learned as a result of the, of the deployment? Sure. So it's been used both horizontally as well as vertically. So um, here in this state, we're working on uh, Highway 101, uh, State 99 project as well. Uh, across the country, multitude of infrastructure projects have been leveraged our technology and digital technology from other partners that are there. From a vertical perspective here locally, the Facebook campus leveraged a variety of different tools and technology, and they brought that project in on time and under budget. By coordinating pre-planning, architects, general contractors, all of the subcontractors, and the, the, the best improvements are when you actually refine the design ahead of time before you begin construction. That's where you receive tremendous savings, cost savings that we've seen. The other leverage is that 80% of costs come after the road, bridge, or highway has been constructed, and it's in the maintenance and operations. So having access to the BIM model, to the materials, the location of where those assets are, so when repairs are needed, the more information that the state has ahead of time in knowing that asset, the less expensive it will be to maintain and manage those assets afterwards. That's helpful. I look forward to your leadership. We have other questions? Yes, Commissioner Van Kneinenberg and then Commissioner Gardino. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, the digitization of our uh, assets has been an ongoing discussion, and maybe at a later time, I don't want to belabor this presentation, but um, I know, uh, Michael Johnson, you've been a part of developing a, our asset management plan, and, and there was a lot of discussion as that was developed of how we digitize both our above ground assets um, and our below ground assets. Um, as, as just a reminder, we have a lot of culverts that um, were installed um, when roads were installed 100 years ago. So, and so as we've been working on these assets, just having a record of where they are. But we, I think this commission recognizes that we cannot make significant leaps in, in uh, savings and construction until we digitize the whole entire platform, but below ground and up above ground. And so that is a pro ongoing priority. And I will just, uh, um, Director, Franziola, your your uh, uh, your predecessor um, had been aware of trying to get a uniformed platform so that local uh, all our local partners, mm -hmm. as they're digitizing their assets, it can it can be on the same platform as the state assets so that they can work together. So that as you come to a an interchange, you don't have two. You know, if you're trying to to blend those together, the local community is using the same platform as the as the state community. So that's an ongoing discussion that needs to be. But it, it, yes, I think you, you raise an, an excellent uh, point that, in, that we're not going to have real savings in construction and maintenance until we do this. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Gardino. Thank you, Chair Inman. Cindy, thank you again for flying all the way across the country to join us today. I'm hoping this is just a first date with this commission and you, your competitors, whomever. Uh, I am a huge believer in investing in our infrastructure, but I'm a frugal believer with tax dollars. And if there are ways that we can save even 5 10%, that's, those are funds that we can allocate elsewhere, and the needs are certainly there to do so. So offline, if it's uh, in concurrence with our chair and our executive director, if there are ways that we can build bridges with our professional staff and interested commissioners on how we actually can apply this more to saving money for our state and its taxpayers and spreading these resources to additional improvements as well. Uh, I would certainly welcome that as one member of the commission. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would concur and I think having a day job in the private sector and the access to information that our development team has versus some of our public partners, 
uh, it's kind of night and day sometimes. And I know that inherently on the public sector side, we have a lot of checks and balances, but the speed of change, I think, is a challenge for all of us to really get our partners uh, on a platform that works and we can all move forward. So I think part, or I know, part of the role of the commission is to advise our legislature, so we would be interested in hearing from you as well as all of our partners in terms of policy recommendations where we have policies that are old, outdated, perhaps, whatever, that are being barriers for us because the world we live in is such that my shopping center development team knows who ate a hamburger 15 minutes before they came to our shopping center and everything else related to that. So I think that it is, we do have to figure out a way collectively. And I think that converse, the comments about our asset management plan, uh, there's some real opportunities for us to be able to have that on a little more um, transparent and, and uh, open so we can really make those good decisions because even though we have new funding, we still do not have all the resources that everybody needs, so we have to use them wisely. So I want to thank you also for joining. Any other comments? If not, thank, thank you, you very much, and thank you, Garth, for continuing to put new innovations. Yes, appreciate it. Okay, we're going to move on to item 15, Paul. Commissioners, tab 15 is an action item on state and federal legislative matters. Commission staff are recommending that you adopt a support position on SB 59 by Senator Allen and send a support letter to the Senator. This bill would require the chair of the commission to establish an advisory committee to develop policy recommendations for the governor and the legislature related to autonomous vehicles. And this would implement a recommendation made by the commission in its 2018 annual report to the legislature. This is the only bill on which commission staff are recommending in action, but I also wanted to provide an update on two other bills on which commission staff have been engaged. Um, first, commission staff have been working with the author's office, Caltrans, and stakeholders on SB 127 by Senator Weiner. Uh, this bill would require Caltrans to include new bicycle and pedestrian facilities or improve existing facilities as part of shop projects located on certain parts of the state highway system. It would also require the Commission to set performance targets in the TAMP for the condition of bicycle and pedestrian facilities as well as safety and accessibility. Uh, commission staff have been working through several issues um, on this legislation such as how safety and accessibility measures could fit in the TAMP, uh, given the TAMP assesses the physical condition of assets. And we continue to work on, on this. The second bill staff would like to provide an update on is SB 277 by Senator Bell, which would modify the local partnership program. The commission discussed this bill um, at its June meeting and sent a letter to Senator Bell outlining some concerns with the legislation, including how funds would be overseen and dispersed and whether funds would be utilized in a timely manner. In July, Senator Bell amended the bill to specify the funding distribution formula for the program. However, the amendments did not address several of the issues raised by the commission. Uh, so commission staff recently submitted proposed amendments to the senator to address the commission's concerns. And a copy of those amendments are included in attachment C. Uh, that concludes my report. Uh, staff recommends you approve this item. Okay, we have a motion and a second to uh, approve the support for SB 59. That's your motion, right, Commissioner? Okay, Commissioner Alvarado and a second by Commissioner Dunn. Is there any discussion? Yes, Commissioner Gometti. Okay, well, let's vote on this motion and then we'll discuss the other bills where we're not taking that aren't including this. So all in favor of this? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? That motion carries. Now we'll go to discussing the other bills that were discussed. Yes, Commissioner Gometti. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Paul, can you give me an update on SB 356, the North Coast Rail Authority? Anything happening there? It's on. I'm sorry, which, which, uh, I SB 356, McGuire, North Coast Rail Authority. Um, yeah. 
that. Uh, it's, I believe it's included in attachment A. I'm having trouble locating it at the moment. I believe it's in the um, Assembly Appropriations Committee at the moment. Yes, it's, it's currently in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. Okay, thank you. Other discussion? Hearing none, we took the action, so we'll move on now to item 16. Paul, you're up again. Commissioners, tab 16 is an informational item on budget and allocation capacity that Caltrans will present. Good afternoon, Chair and uh, Commissioners. I would like to uh, begin by reviewing uh, the final allocation capacity for this fiscal year, fiscal year 1920. Uh, it uh, includes uh, seven billion in allocation capacity for the various uh, transportation programs. That's an increase of uh, about 238 million compared to last year. Uh, this establishes the capacity for projects that, uh, that uh, the commission will allocate during the course of this year. Uh, the amounts uh, uh, in capacity are influenced by a number of things. Uh, uh, first of all, the revenue. Uh, available for these given programs, in some cases uh, by the statutory uh, um, elements associated with uh, SB1 for specific programs, uh, federal appropriation amounts for specific programs, uh, cap and trade, auction proceeds, and uh, also uh, project advancements that have happened in prior years, uh, particularly for the STIP influence what's left uh, in terms of the resources available. Uh, there's also uh, a factor that influences these amounts, which is carry forwards from the prior uh, authority uh, from last year that had not been used uh, by the end of last year. And uh, those, uh, uh, those uh, issues are particularly um, relevant in a couple of programs, the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program and the Transit Intercity Rail Capital Program. In those programs, there's a large uh, program of projects over multiple years, and, uh, and in those programs, the uh, delivery of the allocation of those projects is really back-ended in the period uh, of the uh, program. And because of that, there has been some accumulation of resources that's targeted for use uh, either in this year or in future years, depending on uh, the nature of the program and the, uh, the timing that has been adopted as part of those programs. It, it, these two programs are significantly influenced by infusion of SB1 funding, and so there's an element of uh, ramp up as projects are, have been adopted into the programs and are being brought forward. I also wanted to provide uh, our quarterly update on uh, G12 allocations. Uh, as you recall, uh, the commission has um, delegated authority to Caltrans to make limited adjustments to project allocations. Uh, during the fourth quarter, uh, or actually I'm reporting uh, at the end of the fourth quarter, which is the whole darn year, uh, uh, Caltrans uh, uh, has allocated uh, a net of 100, or has reduced allocations for projects a net amount of 126 million, which consists of reductions of 131 million for shop and increases of five million for STIP. That's the end of this year. I also wanted to give you a look at the last five years uh, of G12 activity. And as you'll see in the information provided, uh, we have consistently each year had reductions in, uh, through the G12 authority in the project allocations uh, uh, with the total of the five-year period being $702 million. And finally, I wanted to give you some information on an issue uh, that is significant for both Caltrans and local agencies as it relates to the Federal Emergency Relief Program. And uh, in short, uh, the federal uh, law 
expects a certain amount of urgency as it relates to uh, the uh, uh, recovery on uh, when federal uh, when damage has occurred and there's federal funding involved. So the federal law requires that uh, uh, within uh, two years of the event, the disaster event, that uh, the projects that are being federally funded reach construction. And uh, if that has not occurred, then uh, for limited reasons, uh, agencies can uh, request an extension from federal highways. Uh, and it really uh, requires some justification of an event outside of the control of the agency. The agency can't say we just haven't gotten to it. There has to be some uh, impact. So um, the good news is those extensions are possible. The bad news is if the extensions aren't granted, uh, then that uh, project uh, no longer has eligibility for federal emergency relief funding. This can present some problems. Uh, unfortunately, uh, disasters and emergencies happen in waves. And so sometimes the volume uh, becomes a challenge for agencies in uh, achieving this timeline uh, and just general staffing levels because of those issues. There is a bill that, uh, that uh, Representative Garamendi has proposed that would uh, adjust the time frame to, from two years to six years. Uh, that would be very helpful in reducing risk of loss of federal funds and, uh, and reduce the administrative burden. Uh, so I just want to make you aware of uh, that uh, issue as it relates to federal emergency relief funding. And that's the conclusion of uh, this presentation. I'd be glad to answer any questions. We have questions? Hearing none, thank you. Okay, we're going to go now to item 17, Paul. Commissioners, tab 17 is an action item to approve the STIP in aeronautics accounts fund estimates. At the Commission's May meeting, it approved assumptions for the fund estimate, and at the June meeting, Caltrans presented the draft fund estimate. In a moment, Caltrans will present the final estimate, but first I wanted to discuss three changes Caltrans proposes to the assumptions approved in May. The first is to increase the minor program reservation from 150 million to 250 million. The second is to specify that the budget change proposal reservation includes budget proposals for the commission. And the third is to specify that the STIP advanced project development element is development element is not available. Commission staff are recommending you approve this item with one modification to the first assumption Caltrans proposes. Specifically, Commission staff are recommending you only approve an increase for the minor program from 150 million to 200 million, rather than the 250 million proposed by Caltrans. This would adjust the funding level to account for inflation since the uh, program was last increased. Uh, Commission staff recommend you hold off on approving the last 50 million while Caltrans and, and Commission staff work together on a common understanding of how the minor program ties to the TAMP and advances the ability to meet the SB1 targets uh, for the four primary asset classes. Commission staff and Caltrans are having active discussions on this issue and hope to reach a common understanding for the October meeting. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Clark. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so uh, as uh, Paul mentioned, this is the culmination of, uh, of um, STIP fund estimate uh, discussions that we've had since the beginning of the, of the calendar year. Uh, we have, uh, you have uh, adopted assumptions. Uh, we reviewed the draft at the last meeting and we held a workshop in July with uh, interested uh, parties uh, to review the information, uh, which will lead to the proposal uh, for you to adopt the uh, STIP and aeronautics uh, fund estimates. Uh, I'll just uh, um, uh, pass by this very quickly because Paul's addressed it, uh, uh, but thank the Commission staff for their recommendation to uh, approve uh, the minor program by 50 million and to uh, have further discussions going forward uh, regarding the remainder of uh, Caltrans' recommendations. Um, just uh, this is a, about as high a level summary and there's a lot of numbers here and so it's uh, uh, still not uh, uh, um, exceedingly easy to, to view. Uh, but in short, uh, the uh, draft fun, uh, fund or the fund estimate proposal has 20.8 billion in capacity for the shop program. 9.2 billion of that has been programmed uh, in the adopted shop 
uh, with 11.6 billion in remaining authority. The STIP program uh, has 2.6 billion in capacity. 2.2 billion of that has been programmed, uh, leaving 400 million in additional capacity. Uh, I wanted to talk in a little more detail about the factors related to the STIP capacity and, uh, and use a comparison between the 2018 fund estimate and the, uh, the proposed 2020 fund estimate uh, in three categories. As it relates to the revenue for the STIP, uh, in comparison between the two uh, periods, uh, and the 2020 fund estimate has revenue of $3.1 billion for the STIP. That's uh, roughly an increase of $15 million. It's not a large increase. Uh, some of the uh, revenue has been impacted by fuel consumption declines, although the SB1 indexing has, uh, has helped, uh, and that's the reason there's some increase in the revenue. But it's fairly flat from the prior uh, fund estimate. The STIP commitments have increased uh, significantly, uh, and these commitments have to do with uh, um, commitments against revenue that didn't materialize uh, as we had projected it uh, because of an increase that didn't take place. There have been a significant level of project advancements uh, as well as advancements under the Advanced uh, Project Development Element Program. These were all good things and they brought forward projects sooner than they would have, but they have increased commitments uh, as compared to the prior period uh, by 700 million. It's a rather significant draw against the uh, current capacity. And, and so at the final point, and this is just an extension of that thought, uh, the actual capacity available uh, in this uh, proposed fund estimate for the STIP has declined by 710 million, which is essentially correlated with the commitments that were made in the prior period using projects that were intended for the, uh, this period that we're addressing at this point. Um, the uh, touching on the aeronautics fund estimate, uh, the dollar amounts are much smaller, uh, but still significant. Uh, the aeronautics fund estimate uh, puts forward an annual capacity of uh, $4.6 million uh, with reliance on the transfer of funds from the local aeronautics, I'm sorry, the local airport loan account. And uh, so with that, um, we uh, echo Paul's uh, recommendation. We ask uh, that you approve the proposed STIP and uh, aeronautics fund estimates. And uh, with that, we would uh, then proceed with publishing the, uh, the fund estimate documents. That's Move my the conclusion. Second. Having a motion by Commissioner Gometti, a second by Commissioner Tavaloni. Is there discussion? I have just one quick question. I think in Paul's request uh, for this continued discussion, the clarification that we're looking for is really how these minor projects are in concert with the TAMP. And so wouldn't we want to know that for the entire 200 million, not just the incremental part? So is that, can we assume that? Yeah, I think that would be the goal for the entire minor program to have an understanding of, of how it um, is consistent with the TAMP. Okay. Bob, did you want to? I would just like to thank um, Susan and her staff um, and everyone with the commission, uh, the working relationship uh, with Caltrans on this. We very much appreciate the increase and the opportunity to continue these discussions. Thank you. Okay. And I think when you have that discussion about how uh, what kind of prioritization? Because even 200 million, we probably have a lot more needs in the states. So, if you can help us all understand accountability and and how all the work that we do on our asset management plan is woven into that, so we don't have a plan sitting over here and we do something else. So, be good. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? abstaining that motion carries thank you Clark okay now we're going to go to Teresa item 18 commissioners item 18 is an information item this item is the 2019 report of step county and interregional share balances otherwise known as the orange book statute requires the Commission keep a record of county share balances and to make the balances through the end of the each fiscal year available to regions by no later than August 15th. 
This year's report was transmitted to the regions on August 1st. The report, report will also be posted on our website. For each county share and for the interregional share, the Orange Book lists the shares available, including all adjustments to those shares and a rec reconciliation to the previous report, that's the 2018 Orange Book, each project program from the share, including any allocations made within the last fiscal year, and the unprogrammed shares remaining. We do on occasionally find errors, and we try to correct them as soon as possible. This is the reason why we share the report in this manner. As always, staff will work with the agencies that have questions about the data on this report. That concludes the report on the STIP share balances. Any comments? Any suggestions? Hearing none, we will move on to the hearing, which my agenda says 2.30, so my okay. apology for anybody who thought we were doing this at 2.30. We'll do it now. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Commissioner, Chair. Um, tab 19 is an information. This is the 2020 STIP guidelines hearing. This is the hearing to discuss the final draft of the 2020 STIP guidelines found under tab 20. Statute requires the Commission to adopt STIP guidelines to describe policy standards, criteria, and procedures for the development, adoption, and management of the STIP. Statute further requires that prior to amending the STIP guidelines, at least one public, public hearing be held. The draft 2020 STIP guidelines were presented to the Commission at the June 27th Commission meeting. Commission staff held a workshop on the draft guidelines on July 22nd where all the regions were invited to participate. Comments received have been considered and some have been incorporated into the guidelines. There are no major changes to the permanent section of the guidelines, guidelines since they were presented to you at the June meeting. Staff did make some changes to the specific sections of the guidelines as follows. Since based on the fund estimate, there is a small capacity that has been identified in the fund estimate in the early years of the STIP, this will allow for, small, for cost increases for the projects that are programmed in the early years of the STIP. However, because the amount is relatively small, if there's a large cost increase, the project may need to be delayed to a later year. Also, uh, the second change is if a project is proposed with uncommitted funds from the, from the following SB1 competitive programs, congested corridors, trade corridors and the LPP program, and they are not successful in any of these programs, the agency has six months to come up with an alternative funding source, delete the project, or replace the project with another project. And finally, APD. APD projects programmed in 1920 may be deleted if the projects have not received an allocation or if Caltrans implemented, if it fits a Caltrans implemented project, no costs have been incurred. These are all the changes to the guidelines from the draft presented to you in June. Staff now recommends the chair opens the hearing for public comment. I will open the hearing. So here we are following staff. Any public comment? No? Hearing none, we can close the public hearing, right, Teresa? That's correct, thank you. Tab 20 is an action item. Commissioners, staff recommends you adopt the 2020 STIP guidelines as presented in your book item. Staff also recommends you authorize staff to make minor technical changes as needed to the guidelines. Staff recommends your approval. Move it. Second. Have a motion by Commissioner a tavaloni, a second by Commissioner Dunn, and a question by Commissioner Van Kenneinenberg. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have some, uh, just one on Section 31. It talks about um, uh, the development of the ITIP. And in the last STIP cycle, there was significant last minute changes. Uh, what was presented in October was different than what was finally put forward by Caltrans and the department and finally adopted in, two, in January. Um, and there was a very little transparency of what happened in the recommendations out of um, 
out of the secretary's office uh, over the Christmas holiday. So I would just ask that, um, and I know we were in 2017 and we, SB1 had just passed and there was a lot of tumult about some things, but I would just ask that we uh, hopefully do a better job about what's presented in, in October uh, not be dramatically changed uh, between what's, what we adopt in, in January or we have a better explanation of why things, uh, the recommendation changes coming out of Caltrans and the, um, and the Secretary's office. Um, and then the second item is in Section 34. Um, once again, I'll express my concern that the uh, Interregional Transportation Strategic Plan has not been updated since 20, uh, since it was last adopted and it was adopted under significant constraints. And so I, I am concerned that we are once again going to go into a cycle where we rely on a strategic plan that was um, for a different time in a different place and that we maybe go back and look at the previous strategic plan from before. Um, I, I know that the, the, the train is leaving the station on that, but um, and that it, we're not in the normal cycle, we wouldn't be adopting the updated strategic plan for another, I believe, year? Is that? When's the I, next adoption of the next strategic plan? I believe it will be in the next year or a year and a half. It will, it will be impacted in the 22 step, right. not this step. Uh, the, just keep in mind our current, the, str the strategic plan that we are operating under was under the constraint funding of 2015-2016. And so it is, and it was developed under that constraint. So it threw out a lot of interregional uh, corridors that uh, are important to many of our rural partners. Uh, and it was, it eliminated those corridors from the strategic plan. So once again, that's going to inform the ITIP. And um, so it, it, a lot of the rural interregional corridors will not be eligible for ITIP funding. And that's, um, I'm troubled by that. Thank you, ma'am. Chair. Yes. Teresa, do you have any uh, comments? I will, uh, Caltrans is here to uh, hear your comments, and I am sure they will be taking your comments into consideration as they, are, they develop the ITIP. Does anybody want to speak in Caltrans, or we're just, we're going to work on it? Is that it? We good, Bob? Yeah. Yes, we'd prefer we work on it. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. That's good. So we have a motion on the floor. Oh, what, more I concur comments? with, I followed this before. I concur with Paul's comments. There were a lot of roads that were eliminated that we thought should have been eliminated. Those were the worst of times, as I recall, in terms of step. They were. Yeah. And, yeah. But, and, and, our, and, our, and our, uh, our strategic plan reflected that, and it had to be that way. It had but to that, be that way. But it's different now. Yeah. That's true. And, but we're still using that old strategic plan, which is, which, in my opinion, is is not um, the best that we can do. I think that's good. Good comments. Any anybody else? I just have a question, and it kind of goes back to Clark and his projections and talking about the fuel consumption wasn't what we thought it was going to be, but the indexing kind of covered that. As we move on our journey to alternative fuels. I think we have to be real careful that the success on one side, the the revenue source is not being offset. So uh, I think we're going to have to be very cognizant of making sure that we have good estimates of what resources we have or perhaps our alternative options for funding. Uh, we need to up the game in terms of that discussion because I think uh, achieving our the vehicle uh, goals will definitely have an impact on uh, the revenues that are coming in. So, alrighty. So, with that, we're ready for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Staining. That motion carries. Okay, my highlighted agenda says this might be a good time for a bio break. It is 329, according to my We'll watch. So let's be back promptly at 345 because we have a lot of work left.